Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to our channel and thank you for logging on. It is 35 degrees here in Philadelphia and I am already planning my escape to warmer climes. I'll need a watch to match and fortunately I've got two titans of two-tone in the hand. On the left, the Tudor Heritage Black Bay S&G Steel and Gold and on the right for 2018 revitalized, reimagined the Omega Seamaster Professional Diver 300 meter. The Tudor came out in 2017. The Omega is new for this year. We're going to go with our relative veteran first. So the Tudor, part of the wildly successful Heritage Black Bay series is bringing back two-tone for a new era and a new generation. This is Tudor's effort to get millennials into colored gold on an everyday watch. And what I should mention is that these watches are very close in size, 41 for the Tudor, 42 for the Omega. But the defining trait of the Tudor dimensionally is going to be the thickness. It is 14.8 millimeters thick to 13.7 for the Omega. So it does have a chunky profile. Uh, the Black Bay 58 is going to be slimmer and an ETA power Black Bay is going to be slimmer, but you do get quite a bit of value in the manufacturing movement. We'll talk about that in a moment. Lug to lug, both watches 50 millimeters on the nose. So there's nothing to tell there. The Tudor is a little bit taller a bit more imposing and one feature that does make it look a bit more modern in its wrist stance is the 22 millimeters between the lugs broader than the 20 of the Omega. The Omega almost has a vintage spacing between the lugs but 22 is very modern and the Tudor is not looking back until you get to the bracelet, which is rivet style, designed to remind you of the shared heritage of Rolex and Tudor bracelets through the 50s and 60s, and the fact that they once quite literally shared Rolex rivet bracelets. The rivets are a skeuomorph, a symbol designed to evoke something of the same image but of different construction. Now the center links are rolled gold. The bezel is solid gold but this is actually folded gold. So they are steel cord and they have a thick layer of gold folded onto them. They're not plated and they won't wear through barring absolute insane trauma. So the main difference here is just that they help this watch to get down to a retail of $49.75 versus $9,700 for the Omega. Now they do have sizable links fitted with screws. Not too many of them. There's not a whole lot of adjustability built into the bracelet or the clasp. You have three different anchoring points. You have a few extra removable links, but there's nothing like the extension and the push button slider of the Omega. That said, the clasp is quite robustly constructed. It's nicely made and there are premium features like spring-loaded ceramic pin snaps to ensure that the clamp shell locking mechanism remains crisp over time. It feels as good as a Rolex bracelet from 10 years ago. That said, it does trail the Omega just a bit in solidity and features. Moving back to the case, you can see this is why both of the watches wear the same dimension across the wrist. They're both big cases, but they have pivoted end links, so they don't flare out like a solid end link bracelet would. One of the key differences is the beveling of the lugs. The Tudor has inherited the sheer super case profile from its Rolex stable mates, but it maintains a vintage inspired thin hairline bevel, which is both graceful and much appreciated. Now the bezel. The bezel features an anodized aluminum insert, so it's not ceramic like the Omega, but again, price is a factor. Also a factor, the sharp and micro knurled edge that makes this so much easier to grip than the Omega. Easier to grip easier to manipulate, especially if your hands are wet, sweaty, or gloved. This is the easy choice. And the bezel action is so much crisper than the Omega. Look at those shallow bevels. You can barely grip this bezel. And you can barely hear it. Now jumping back to the Tudor's dial design, again, not a whole lot to tell with the case. Polished flanks, hairline bevel on the side, satin finish tops. The Chapter ring style gilt printed dial is handsome. Vintage evocative. This is one of the Black Bay models that has a date and this might be divisive for some but it does help the watch to hold its own in this test because the Omega has a date and these are designed to be everyday watches not occasional watches or retro novelties. These are designed to be pieces you use every day and most folks do prefer a date so I consider that an asset here. All of the indices and hands are applique though I believe they are plated rather than the solid gold units used on the Omega. It is a matte black base that contrasts rather rather dramatically with the gloss polished ceramic of the Omega. So what else do we have? Well, inside the case, chronometer certified, protected down to 200 meters thanks to the screw down rolled gold crown. Tudor MT5612, 70 hour power reserve, full balance bridge, free sprung balance for shock resistance, silicon hairspring for anti-magnetism, COSC certified Swiss chronometer, quick set date and hacking seconds, and a 288 beat rate. This is an all around modern dive watch that happens to cop the look quite effectively of its vintage forebears, staying more in touch with its heritage than for example Rolex, which is relentlessly progressive and modern. So this is the throwback special in the Tudor Rolex family. 
The Omega. Okay, the Omega is new for this year, but the design is 25 years old. First launched in 1993, this design rose to fame on the wrist of Pierce Brosnan as 007. His first, GoldenEye, was the high watermark, but for that movie alone and the game that followed, we treasure his stint as 007. And the watch that he helped to launch to superstardom. No longer a 41, this is now a 42 millimeter case, and you can see on the wrist, 30, or 13.7 millimeters thick is quite distinct from 14.8, and the case band itself is far slimmer, so the watch is thinner in fact, but it looks far thinner, almost half as thick as the Tudor. Again, 50 millimeters lug to lug, exactly the same. 42 millimeters in diameter, a key difference is the crown guard structure, which gives you a little bit more protection against shearing, but will dig the wrist on some. You'll also note that the spacing between the lugs, 20 millimeters, it, doesn't look quite as contemporary as the Tudor when you're looking at it head on from the lug side. That said, the bracelet is immense. These are the real deal. Not rolled, not plated, but solid gold intermediate links. The bracelet is a solid piece. You have the same removable links thanks to screw fixed removables, and you have the same access to half links that you get on most premium divers. This is not a feature of the Tudor, but there's a lot more going on here as you have a push button slider, and then you have an all or nothing fold out dive clasp. Is that tech or what? Previously, if you wanted all of these features on an Omega, you would have had to go upscale to one of the higher end dive watch families. Now you get it on the Diver 300 with the same hewn from a solid block clasp quality that this watch model line made famous first in the 90s and 2000s. Reprofiled helium escape valve. This watch 300 meters versus 200 for the Tudor with the helium escape valve versus none for the Tudor. So you can use this for saturation diving and you can now open that helium escape valve underwater. That's a new feature for this generation for 2018. The dial itself features gold applique, gold skeleton hands, and a dial base that is ceramic and laser etched. The dial both looks and is of higher quality than the Tudor. And I happen to think that the use of a scalloped index at six o'clock and a six o'clock date better balances the dial versus the replacement of the index at three o'clock on the dial of the Tudor. You also note the contrast between matte finish and gloss finish with the two. The bezel is immeasurably higher in quality, though not as satisfying in action. The use of ceramic rather than anodized aluminum on top of a solid gold base speaks to the money invested in this piece. Nevertheless, if you want to actually use your bezel as opposed to enjoy it or fend off scratches and scuffs, you're going to find that the Tudor is functionally better, the Omega is materially better. Now, turning it all over, inside the case, 55 hour power reserve coaxial Metaz chronometer, effectively amagnetic. The Tudor has a silicon hairspring. This can take 1.5 Tesla or more, or over 15,000 Gauss. It is simply a more robust movement, more water resistant, greater anti-magnetism, and the same free sprung balance with a full balance bridge. 55 hour power reserve versus 70, so it's at a slight disadvantage. It also has the hack seconds and the quick set date. The coax technology inherited from Dr. George Daniels and now rock solid in its latest iteration is absolutely bulletproof and does create a watch that can run far better than the coaxial chronometer standard pre previously applied, which was generally with silicon hairspring minus one plus five in-house at Omega. Well, with the new master chronometers, they're even better than that, to say nothing of the COSC testing standards. Display case back, you get nothing of the like on the Tudor, so that's an important distinction for many who both have an interest in the movement and a desire to see it. Now, what else can I mention? Well. Frankly, this watch is the business. It's $9,700 and almost twice the price of the Tudor for a reason. The mechanical technology of the coaxial, the ceramic bezel, the quality of the bezel, the quality of the dial, the amagnetism in the display case back, the 300 meter diving depth and the helium escape valve, the quality of the bracelet and the quality of the clasp, as well as the slim profile. And let's face it, this watch is more of a preemptive nuclear strike against the Rolex two-tone sub at 13400 than a direct rival for the Tudor at its $4,975 base price. All of which said, the Tudor does carry some advantages. It's half the price of the Omega. Second, it has a longer power reserve. That might mean more to people who have a collection and tend to rotate through their watches. The bezel grip and act is superior. It sounds better. It feels better. It has no crown guards, and for many, that's a practical convenience. It's simply easier to grip the crown. Ultimately, the lug spacing is broader, and it has a more contemporary stance on the wrist. So you guys let me know in the comment below, would you pay twice the price for the Omega, or would you save your beans, go for the Tudor, and maybe start saving your real bullets for a two-tone sub, or even the Omega itself? Let me know. But my choice is the Omega. I've always been an Omega man. That ain't changing today. 
Tudor wins the loom shot with heavier application on the hands. Omega wins the warranty with 5 versus 2.